Yeah, this doesn't really feel like a mobile game. Here's a question that will sound a bit silly at first for the majority of people that clicked on this video. What is Victoria 3? One way to define it is as a game that attempts to simulate world history from the years 1836 CE to 1936 CE. Now, there's some issues in that definition. One is that it doesn't really say what the gameplay is, sure, but another is that the game doesn't actually simulate history, does it? Or not exactly. It does offer a model of history, a machine that generates history, if you will, but by the end of a run of the game, there's infinitely many things that could have deviated from the real world record of that century long span of time. The game presumes that there are many constituent parts that make up 1836 to 1936, ranging from technology to historical individuals like the titular Victoria to the modeling of events and the mechanics of simulation. Keep this in mind moving forward. So everyone here probably has a sense of what history is. To make sure we're on the same page, I'll give an incredibly generic and broad definition. History is both the study of the past and the generally accepted series of events that make up the past. Now there are some uh, points of contention over what those events are, but let's table that. So then, how do we get history? Well, the short version is that people research and then other people take that research and put it into a context, and then we debate what to learn from it, what lens to use, and if we even understand events correctly. So sure, you've heard of history, but have you heard of historiography? It's an academic discipline centered on the way we write about history. Okay, and why am I bringing it up in a video about a video game? One can view Victoria 3 and indeed many Paradox games as a telling of history. It believes certain things and expresses them through mechanics. Comparing two history games about the same era, it would be fair to say they have different mechanics, prioritize different things in their gameplay, but in practice result in a different framing of history. There's a difference between a game like Medieval Total War with its focus on, uh, war, and a game like Crusader Kings 3 and its focus on kings, or, well, people, broadly. Think of who you play as, what losing looks like, how places are named, and you'll get the idea. One could say these games have differing lenses on the same period of history. One could walk away from Total War or Age of Empires 2 and get the sense of the era as the Dark Ages, and from CK3 and get a sense of the era as a giant soap opera. The same comparisons can be drawn between iterations of a period by the same company, as with Victoria 2 and Victoria 3. Note, however, I don't think every change from the old game means an updated lens, of course. Some stuff was just harder to model, like Canada's sub-dominions or Africa's decentralized nations, as the game puts it. I'm not going to try and pick apart the uh, mechanical quirk of how sphering China in Vic 2 collapsed the global market half the time. But I do think, as I said in the other Victoria video, that the new mechanics make it easier to be nuanced and detailed with history. To continue the China example, think about how playing as Britain in Vic 2, you wouldn't actually have much incentive to fight the Opium Wars as they happened in history. What's the point of forcing Chinese markets open if it might crash everything? In Victoria 3, the global market is no longer some massive nebulous blob and getting access to and subsuming other countries' markets is a form of expansion, so now the opium wars actually have a purpose. Now, do I think the change shows that Paradox has altered their perception of history? I can't say, but in this case I kinda doubt it. What I do know is that it more accurately models the era according to the lens the game is using, which is in this case a more refined version of its predecessor, a materialist lens focused on material conditions. The game is very interested in the concept of standards of living, but we'll come back to that because first we should get a fuller understanding of historiography, and what better way to do that than to look at it in its original context, academic history. For a brief example of why applying a critical lens to a work can be important, and bearing in mind I've already mentioned the topic, let's look at this essay I found on the Opium Wars which posits a new framing of the war, that the British were reacting to Chinese aggression and not the aggressors themselves. It's a 10 page paper that later spawned a book which has, as I've looked it up, gotten little attention, but having read the essay I'm skeptical of many claims within. The author seems to be as well, given the part where he admits the Chinese threat to women and children, so prominently placed in his abstract, is embellished. See, clickbait isn't just a YouTube thing. 
Historiography is important for things like discussion and skepticism, for new challenges to the historical narrative, and for rebuttal of said challenges. This, however, is a work with no real engagement, so we'll be moving to one I've read with a more healthy discussion around it, and then we'll work our way to talking about Victoria. Sheila Fitzpatrick is a respected Australian historian of Soviet life and events. In her book, The Russian Revolution, she talks about, well, the title kind of gives it away, huh? She discusses the Russian Revolution, but her particular lens differs from what one might consider typical in that she broadens the scope a bit, seeing the revolution as a continuous line from arguably 1905's revolution all the way through to Stalin. Now this does a few things to how she tells this history. Some positives, in my view, are that she puts the revolution in a context, exploring the events preceding October 1917. In doing so, Fitzpatrick manages to capture the often overlooked revolutionary potential of the peasant class, which was highly relevant as recent as 1905. Some weaknesses of this lens come from how the substantiations lessen as the book goes on, but we'll get deeper into that later. Looking at the lens she uses, critiquing the angle she takes, and the way the book depicts history, all that is historiography. And this process can be put onto Victoria 3. Now, I know it's a game, not an academic work attempting to contextualize, deepen, or reframe our understanding of history, but that doesn't mean it lacks a lens. The game, as a simulation of history, sits somewhere between an academic exercise, fictional simulator, and a work of media, with all the avenues for dissection and interpretation afforded by each of those categories. There's no way you just build a simulation this big and don't think about the history you're constructing. So let's do something unorthodox for a video about video games and do a little tutorial on historiographic research. If you already know how to do historiography or just want to skip to the meatier bits of the essay and don't want a tutorial, there will be a time code for where to skip to. To keep it extra simple, we'll be looking at what people have said about Sheila Fitzpatrick's work that I've already been talking about. We will be going to a site called JSTOR, link provided below, which is an online archive filled with primary and secondary historical sources, also boasting some added features and citation tools and all that. For our purpose, we're going to be looking at what they offer in the form of articles. With respect to access, well, as I understand it, most college campuses will provide access in some manner, but knowing that's not a resource everyone has and that the alternative can sometimes be expensive, we're going to be looking at an option I think most people can access, which is, for now, free. And that's registering with a Google account, aka probably a Gmail. Whatever way you manage to get into the site, here's what you then do. In one line, put Sheila Fitzpatrick, and in the other, put the work The Russian Revolution. Don't mark Fitzpatrick as an author, or you'll just get works by her, which is not what we want. Note this site also supports Boolean search methods if you're familiar with those, but then again, at this point, so does Twitter, so like, maybe that's not an impressive feature to list. The point of these types of searches is to find what people are saying about a work, sometimes then following up on who that person is and what they themselves focus on or have written. On occasion, you'll stumble into some apparent biases, but it's ultimately up to you to decide if something feels like an uncharitable critique. The other function we might look into is finding articles by the author we are learning about, be they shorter form content discussing an individual subject, or, as occasionally happens, a critique they themselves have done of an author who may have critiqued them. Sometimes these things form a web of interesting discussion. And sometimes they degenerate into weird name-calling spats that last half a decade, but we'll save that for another video. And that's all there is to it, at least with respect to exploring discussion within a subfield of history. As I said before, the site has other uses, and there are other sites one could use, but I find JSTOR to be relatively comprehensive, and it's usually my first stop. Anyway, time to welcome back the people who skipped ahead. And that's basically how you use a back channel to crash the university's servers in order to get free access while they're resetting everything. It might only last an hour or two, but any tabs you keep open or have saved should stay up and will be unnoticeable amid the rest of the user base. Okay, nerd stuff done, time for more nerd stuff. Now, I'm not going to tell everyone to pause the video and go read a copy of the Russian Revolution in order to follow along. In fact, one of the uses of a review in something like historiography is to get a condensed understanding of what the author has written. From framing to biases to sometimes even critiques of quality and accuracy, these articles can give someone a lot of info in a short time. They won't teach you history, usually, but they will teach you how historians discuss history. Let's look at some reviews of Fitzpatrick's work. 
First, we have a review in The Slavic Review by Professor Alan Wildman, a noted historian in his own right who focused on Russia, particularly situating his lens on workers, soldiers, and peasants. Wildman provides analysis of the 1982 edition of Fitzpatrick's work, before revision, as well as a concise description of Fitzpatrick's thesis. Fitzpatrick sees a single process from the revolution of 1917 through to the first five-year plan. It must be viewed as a revolution fulfilled rather than a revolution betrayed. That the resulting configuration fails to resemble the original ideology simply conforms to the natural rhythm of revolutions. Or put another way, it's a feature, not a bug, that the Russian Revolution resulted in autocracy. The first of his critiques center on Fitzpatrick's application of a social history lens, which he calls timely but misapplied. In Wildman's view, the concern over a successful revolution or a failed one ends up centering too much on the ideological pinnings, while Fitzpatrick herself provides material analysis through discussion of modernizations. Success becomes a loaded concept, overburdened with applying to both societal change and industrialization. The second critique, a bit more damning, centers on the nature of revolutionary spirit among workers, that Fitzpatrick fails to present this spirit as continuing to 1917, aside from occasional mentions of moments like the Kronstadt Uprising, where said spirit conflictingly ran counter to the establishment revolution. Boy, is that a phrase. And finally, there is a noted, in Wildman's view, absence of discussion around political maneuvering, which I'll get back to. I'll pause here to say this. Both this argument and the next one on Fitzpatrick's work are not in service of discarding the whole thing. They aren't said to make her out to be a quack, but as statements of perspective, points of discussion. If you heard me say that a different professor argues she got something wrong and immediately decided to root against her, or perhaps that this must be a dunk fest on a bad book, then you might have some recalibrating to do from internet discourse mode. Ultimately, Wildman leaves us on the note that Fitzpatrick's social history lens is an invaluable one, if only somewhat misapplied. From here, we move on to the similarly named Slavonic Review, and a review by Professor John Keep of the University of Toronto. Now, I don't know of Keep's work or his inherent biases, but you can see how this academic pedigree and background digging could become a massive rabbit hole. We aren't going to do that today. Unsurprisingly, the portion of his review that caught my attention was his disagreement with and argument against Fitzpatrick's framing. Two things stood out in his disagreement. One, he claims that Fitzpatrick insufficiently identifies Stalin as the end of the revolution, which is to be expected since it's her more boundary-pushing claim slash consequence of framing. And two, he uses a very loaded phrase, the regime's contempt for all civilized values. Now, this doesn't throw his critique out so much as give us a sense of what his concerns are and what angle he might be coming from. There's also a moment where he describes her account as erroneous with respect to who ordered the death of the Tsar. And that's worth pointing out, but it's also one of those most historians agree type things and not a detriment to an argument she is making. He ends by calling the work intelligent but insufficient, and then arguing the general limits of Western scholars, that the field may need to wait to hear from voices coming out of the ex-Soviet countries. And now let's turn to me. Writing for the channel Rosenkreutz on YouTube, uh, no, I'm gonna drop this bit. My position is that Fitzpatrick does a good job at balancing two things, narrative and connectivity, and societal conditions. Like Wildman, I find her social history approach interesting. Granted, it's far less novel than it was in the early 80s, but I find decentering the great men while telling the story of revolution in specific to be an ideal framework. She explores the context of Russia and its constituent parts in the peasantry and the Soviets, as in like worker councils, not as in Soviet the quasi-nationality. And while doing so, she manages a readable air. It almost feels like a story of sorts, and we are led from one bit to the next. That's not to say she's traded historicity for consumability. It's an engaging work that isn't rendered inaccurate through simplification, unlike certain pop historians. In light of that, we return to Wildman, who mentioned the absence of political maneuvering when discussing Stalin's rise. And while I would normally agree, Fitzpatrick is, as Wildman himself noted, using a social history lens, which attempts to find answers alternative to those centered on the action of empowered individuals. Nevertheless, there is a bit of a blind spot there. As for my critique, well, one very, very odd habit of Fitzpatrick is to affirm her personal belief in the futility of revolution. 
Wildman notes it as part of her thesis, but I do not mean her end point of Stalinism slash a Thermidorian reaction is inevitable, as he did. That to me is a cogent understanding of the situation, even if I disagree or think it simplifies things a little. No, on occasion she has what I can best describe as diatribes. All revolutionaries are enthusiasts, zealots, all are utopians, with dreams of creating a new world in which the injustice, corruption, and apathy of the old world are banished forever. They are intolerant of disagreement, incapable of compromise, mesmerized by big distant goals. Violent, suspicious, destructive. Revolutionaries are unrealistic and inexperienced in government. Their institutions and procedures are extemporized. They have the intoxicating illusion of personifying the will of the people, which means they assume the people is monolithic. It is the nature of revolutions to end in disillusionment and disappointment. My favorite instance of this is on page 84. No doubt all successful revolutions have this characteristic. The revolutionaries must always be driven by enthusiasm and irrational hope, since they would otherwise make the common sense judgment that the risks and costs of revolution outweigh the possible benefits. Note the use of the word successful there. We won't be going anywhere with it, but it does get me thinking about how revolutionary success is framed for Fitzpatrick. She does this on several occasions, sidetracks her narrativization of events to start opining on the nature of revolutionaries and futility. I'd like to remind everyone watching that asserting moderation is still a bias. She isn't neutral just because she's centered her perspective in a status quo appreciating position. Add to that the footnote of how she refers to Nestor Machno's anarchist movement as basically just another peasant revolt and you end up with the lens dirtied by her own ideological position. And that dirt blocks her from seeing capital A anarchism as part of the conversation around Machno, which is perhaps an extension of the critique levied by Wildman, that of both inhabiting and excusing herself from the question of ideologies. Earlier I snuck in mention of Fitzpatrick having a revised edition, and I did that for a reason. Let's address that. Books, you know, those, right? Well, they have this thing, especially in history, where they get reprinted as new editions, not just to have more copies in the world, but with updates to the text. Taking Fitzpatrick's book as an example, a new edition was printed and included some textual updates after 1991, because the original was from 82 and started in 79, before the Soviet archives opened up. The book changed when new information became available, which is made clear in an added section of the introduction. Now, the book didn't say, never mind, I was wrong, never print this again, or something. Fitzpatrick did stand by her premise, but there were changes. By extension, we come to another question which could also spiral out, that of patches, DLC, general updates. Things change, and there may not be a perfect time to review, critique, or analyze a game for its content and ideas. It would be twice as negligent to wait for the end of updates to finally discuss a game than it is to discuss an incomplete version. Now is as good a time as any, so long as we don't get stuck talking about things like bugs and adjusting values or, god forbid, literacy rates. A critical facet of Victoria 3 is how determined it is to not be deeply on rails, for now. From a gameplay perspective, it is nearly the inverse of Hearts of Iron, where one plays out a routine leading to the war, where focuses are pretty consistent, where there are focus trees at all, and alt history is largely dictated by actively choosing subversions. Victoria is more simulator than many other Paradox games, and I know that sounds a bit loaded, but I'd place it a lot closer to CK than, say, Hoy on the historical predetermination spectrum. Things will deviate after 1836. There is no promise of a Soviet Russia, no promise of a great war even, but that doesn't mean there aren't opportunities. It's just that said opportunities are not scripted. In some sense, this is similar to the way emergent gameplay works in stuff like immersive sims or TTRPGs. Something happens that makes history, rather than an event being announced. There's a lot of interesting elements to that design, and one implicit drawback that circles back to the familiarity thing from before. And connected to that is an issue around remarkability. Do you think the player is primed to notice the remarkable nature of gameplay moments as they're happening in a way they might if events were predetermined or familiar? Would the player notice a global financial crash as an event in their history without a text box declaring it so? As with real history, some things are rendered unremarkable unless one is looking for them and applying the right perspective and lens. As with real history, it is seldom easy to declare an event significant while in the midst of it. 
I don't want to linger on that idea for too long, but it bears mention. While this sim, this emergent history design, has led to some interesting bugs before launch, and you'll never hear me say this again, a bug like the Super Confederacy is emblematic of a very strong design philosophy. Victoria seeks to be a generator of history, a simulation of hypothetical 1836 to 1936s, built on constituent parts in such a way where it would be unlikely, but not outright impossible, to recreate our own world history. There aren't many inevitabilities that exist in the game that aren't derived from material conditions or circumstances of a nation. Let's go back and talk about why the Super Confederacy bug existed, and you'll see what I mean. The Super Confederacy is based in two things. One, the somewhat inflexible nature of interest groups, making any landowner revolt a CSA revolt, even if slavery is not the crux. And two, the way the game allocates power bases. The short of it is that even in the North, the landowner group class has a majority share of power at the start. As such, unless industrialization is rather rapid and contained to the North, there won't be many non-landowner controlled states in the event of a rebellion. In the face of a pre-industrial rebellion, which is more likely early game or if the US fails to industrialize, landowners will take most of the country with them, and landowners just happen to be the CSA. For better or worse, that's how the game creates the American Civil War without railroading. This isn't a consequence of Paradox failing to understand the Civil War, somehow thinking that the abolitionist North would just secede to join the slave states, it's a consequence of how the game attempts to avoid forced events, and relies instead on interest groups, demography, power bases, wealth, living standards, and so on. It's a really big hiccup, but it shows us a bit of the inner workings of the game, and how it creates dynamic history around things like class and power. That the game can make a mistake like this shows how differently it's structured from Victoria 2, but that doesn't mean it's got nothing in common with the previous game, and we'll touch on that soon. This is the moment for historiography. We, in Critique, are identifying the lens the game uses to present history. We then critique the game on how it pulls that off, or indeed, the adequacy of using the lens it does. Going all the way back to the beginning when I mentioned Total War, is it not easy to imagine a TW game set in the Victorian era that ostensibly neglects to include the people in its history? It might even find a particular lens to use that does explain the way societies functioned in that time, but I sort of doubt it. Rather than being driven to colonize a new chunk of land because of a booming and ever hungrier industrial sector that is seeing mass shortages of rubber, simpler games would have you just taking a plot of land because you can. There's a reason Victoria 2 is notoriously not map painter friendly, and it's because it's designed around resource acquisition more than big name on map. Circumventing the question of AI efficacy in favor of one about developer intent, it's clear that Victoria 3 prioritizes material conditions the acquisition of land for the sake of resources, the disproportionate power of the upper class, and the transference or wresting of that power. It takes a materialist lens to history, as did its predecessor. Nowhere is this more apparent than the standard of living value and its key position. So much of gameplay amounts to dragging up that number, enriching your country, but more than the coffers, enriching your people. There are, of course, certain abstractions and sacrifices made to keep history from becoming too derailed, or as I'd like to think of it, to keep the characters a bit familiar, down to aesthetics even. Now, there aren't characters in this game as there normally would be. The US is not a person, and please, please can we not get into country people? The developers made some choices to preserve some degree of familiar borders. Let's look at the Decentralized Nation Dev Diary for a glimpse at what I mean. In one part, they outline the prior iterations of the border for North America, especially in the Great Plains, and then explain what they were thinking. There's already some compromises in this version. We still ended up pursuing a modified version of that proposal that did more to preserve the borders of larger imperial borders. We didn't want too many avenues for the United States to colonize its way into historical Canadian territories, or for Mexico to colonize its way into Minnesota. Compromises are, as we see here, a necessary yet still selective process. The railroading of historical boundaries doesn't apply in many other places on the map, and I'm not just talking about AI quirks like the US or Netherlands taking chunks of Patagonia. Patagonia itself is another good example where there's nothing stopping the Chilean AI or player from going eastward rather than south. This isn't in here to dismiss the existence of or the extent of native federations, and it's a tricky balance because I'm genuinely unsure how to feel about it. On the one hand, like I've decried in other videos, it does present an inaccurate history. But on the other, 
Having seen how upset players get over an unclean, i.e. not straight line on the map at the 49th parallel for the US and Canada, I understand why they would want to fudge things, to make historical borders a little more likely to emerge. Arguably, this is a touch of railroading, and it's really up to the individual to agree with or dissent from the liberty being taken with history in these cases. I don't think this quite fits into the gameplay before historicity clause in that the borders that might emerge from this, aside from in hyperbole, don't make the game unplayable or tedious. Noting that this isn't so much a discussion of the lens of Victoria 3 as it is the potential to bend history, let's move on to something more mechanical. Curiously, Victoria 3 acts as a bit of a representation of that issue between Wildman and Fitzpatrick about the emphasis on political actors, individuals. Victoria 2's representation of populations, demographics, and parties that had nameless leaders, of countries who literally didn't even list a named ruler, was a dramatic step away from the centering of individuals in historical narratives. And in some ways, I respected the game for that approach. But Victoria 3 brings in individuals, with portraits, and their personal vision for a country or interest group shaping the agenda of whatever they lead. To continue using Wildman's phrasing, there's more room for modeling the political maneuvering. Interest groups now exist and have leaders who do impact the group trajectory. But this might model the lens a bit, especially when it forces us into the position of excusing historical modeling on limitations of the medium. That groups could never be so granular as actual history, and that IGs are a bit… universal. Liberals, barring a particular leader trait, all support multiculturalism at the start, which, while later associated with liberalizations and progressivist movements of the latter half of the century, was not a shared trait of the aggressively nationalist spirit of 1848, nor famous liberal thinkers in the Anglosphere. In some sense, Victoria falls victim to the same issues that generally plague social and to some extent material history. There's a blind spot for ideology. While Victoria 2 had its blunt representation of class consciousness as a literal numerical value, Victoria 3 has populations become politically active with time and over the course of radicalizations. And while the game manages to set up a strong framework for using a materialist lens and tackling questions of material reality like standards of living, it forgoes discussion of the impact of the immaterial in many ways. Yes, people can have individual wills with regard to political questions like abolition, feminism, and ethno-nationalism, but the political interest groups end up in this somewhat reductive position where they care for the political questions but not the distinctions of ideologies. Or to put it another way, as interesting as it is that some countries have their industrialists be monarchists and some leaders direct them to be of fierce nihilists or what have you, the distinctions between movements is rendered at present less than aesthetic. A weak point of social history and material history is explaining why an individual's interests might extend beyond their own material condition. This might sound like psychology fluff, but sometimes it really is just human nature to be unpredictable, or to hold on to biases and interests that can't be measured against some consciousness meter. In Victoria 2, a highly conscious aristocrat would always be a slavery-endorsing monarchist who tightly gripped power, aware as they were of their own situation. But in reality, we know of historical examples of very aware nobles who sided with the French Revolution, not out of self-preservation nor selfless martyrdom, but because they believed in the political project, in a different world. By virtue of its construction around interest groups, Victoria 3's materialist lens falls into a bind. On one hand, it very effectively models class antagonisms and power distribution, that the nobles wouldn't just vote themselves powerless just because Marx wrote a manifesto somewhere in Japan. But on the other, we end up in a place where the distinction between liberalism, socialism, and fascism is somehow reduced to an IG's leaning. Pops lack convicted moral centers, and instead defaults to a harsh materialism or being led by demagogues. And like, of course I'm not suggesting the game simulates some person's upbringing and exposure to new ideas and different people in determining where they, as a petit bourgeois, fall on the national socialism question, but there is a notable absence at times of space for individuals to exist beyond their material well-being or the material interests of their interest group. Another weak point, not unique to the social history lens, is that despite all the attention on internal politics and what people want in terms of needs, there's no real way to represent the people in one's diplomacy. Interest groups don't show preferences for countries. Republican IGs don't disdain working with autocracies. In real history, one of the biggest parts of the era was the justification of colonization, both to shape external image and to sell the idea of the civilizing mission to people of one's own nation. 
Britain's fierce battling of the slave trade is argued by those with less whimsy for the empire in their hearts to be an attempt to garner the image of being a nation that loved freedom through the act of literal emancipation. And while there's a banned slavery CB, there's no pressure from your pops to use it. There's a complete disconnect between the domestic and international of the political and diplomatic systems, and I think that may be the one big fundamental flaw. Fundamental in a way that they might not choose to or even be capable of changing. Taking World War I as an example and extending the issue slightly, the influence of what the game would consider the armed forces IGs was instrumental to why the war happened, despite everyone's better judgement. The voice militaries had in government and the popularity of military interests among the people absolutely dictated foreign policy. This cannot be modelled in the game as it is, and there may be design limitations, or there may be a failure of lens. I can't exactly confirm an answer, which leads us to… There's one final element here. I don't know what's intended all the time. Mechanics, bugs, simulations, sometimes it's a bit blurry, sometimes it's by design. Does Paradox intend inaccurate literacy rates? I doubt it, but it's what we have in front of us at the moment I record this. Literacy rates aren't a very good measure of much, and I'm glad their importance has shifted. That aside, I don't know if the rates are a product of the other systems or a framing of history. I can't say anything about the relative ease of one country transforming into a powerhouse over another. At some point, there comes a moment of personal distinction, where something must be interpreted as intended or not. Victoria can be a flawed presentation of its own ideas, a game that wants to portray something and doesn't quite manage or poorly conveys it, or even implies something different in how it actually works. It won't always be the perfect machine, but the developers could decide it gets good enough when some players still find it unsatisfactory. With Victoria 2, there's an understanding some players take that the game is making a statement on the efficiency of capitalism, while others think it's bad AI. Eventually I'll make a whole video on disempowerment versus player autocracy that will explore this specific example in detail, but let's touch on it here for the sake of this specific discussion. In Victoria 2, is the way that capitalists are designed intentional? Is it a statement or a mistake? I could argue, and in fact prefer on some level, a certain framing, that capitalists in real life don't exist to benefit the state in some ideal way. They don't set about building what an autocratic planned economy would, and in terms of gameplay, should not, then, be an autopilot button. They make factories based on guesses and profit motives and what business they know, and sometimes they flop. But conversely, maybe it's a bit foolish for the imagined capitalist to build a clothing factory when the nation lacks access to any of the necessary input goods, you know? Maybe the AI is flawed and cannot be taken as a representation of anything. I almost want to ask about the way one even finds the ideal level of AI competence, but again, tabling that for the disempowerment video. Overall, as I said with Fitzpatrick and the dings against her work, this isn't damning. It's a perspective, and it's one that puts the game in a conversation with the vast field of historiography, and by virtue of that, it doesn't have to, and indeed should not be, the only one. Discussing portrayals of history is historiography, even if the medium is a game. Ultimately, I'll say this. There are many ways to look at the game, the way it's changed from the previous iteration, the way it functions on its own, etc., and conclude what history the game conveys. There are ways to look at the game historiographically and draw out its ideas and beliefs and framings of events. DLCs and patches change things, add some depth, and while I think lacking depth in some areas isn't great, I don't think it makes much of a historical argument. Paradox not fleshing out the South American Cadillo era to my taste doesn't mean they're removing that history from circulation as some conscious act. And I don't think it's fair to say they're making a game first and history second. I think being as competent as they can in how they model history is a big goal of theirs, and it's partly up to players to decide if they pull it off, to put the lens to the test, to bring up interesting ideas and faults and talk them through, to do historiography with the game. And I, I can't believe I have to say this, but yes, this is also just a game, and yes, you can play it brain off or brain selective on. Analysis on this level is just another way of engaging an interest. It doesn't necessarily mean decoding some grand truth or admonishing a company for the way it presents an era. Critical analysis through something like a literary lens, looking at themes, feels insufficient for a game like this. If someone asked what are the themes of Victoria 2, you could kinda answer, but it would mean both the querent and you bending what the word theme even means. These games are more history than story, and entirely different in the way they do narrate 
narrative from a narrative-driven RPG, even if they do absolutely generate narrative. Comparing Victoria to history itself directly also doesn't work, because it isn't a portrayal of history one-to-one -one and certainly isn't meant to be. Victoria 3, when viewed for its history, cannot be viewed as purely an expression of what comes out of it, but for its constituent machinery. It almost goes without saying that they aren't doing history wrong when it goes alt. Zebulon Worthington isn't a flaw in the lens, he's a product of the machine. That's why conversation centers more on intent and premise than presentation. This doesn't all lead to some grand declaration that Paradox secretly harbors an idea of the one true perspective on history. Their different games take different approaches and project different angles of history, simplify or dive into different things. These framings organize around what they want the gameplay to be centered on, a war game, an economy game, the quest to convert the world to cat girl worship. In turn, they look at the world differently, and maybe that's not that striking of an endnote, but the way they perceive that world when aiming to critique or discuss ought to be treated as an act in writing history, engaged with historiography. I don't know what next time will be, but I know it won't be Victoria 3. I need a break from thinking hard about this game. That said, I always seem to find time and brain space for discussions taken in good faith. Antagonize me on Twitter or if you ever see me in the Reddit thread on the game. Subscribing and sharing appreciated. Vicky3 content is like the algorithm on hard mode because there's so much of it it's genuinely rare to get picked up on platform without a boost, so to speak. Thanks to all the patrons who make making these videos a bit easier for me, some of whom are new, even. Special thanks to Etienne Garant, Hausum, and Knight Swirgen, and all the new names on the list. I hope nobody new signs up for Patreon or leaves it at this point, because I'm making meme dollars a month, and funny numbers are worth all the gold in Albion. Bonus thanks to Twitter follower Tobias for making a mod after a nebulous joke request of mine. It changes the US culture name tables to make characters use the names from that Japanese baseball game like Todd Gonzalez. Without question, I'm linking that below. That's all for now. Hope you've all been enjoying the game, or found something in this video you liked even if you haven't or have no intent to play the game. Uh, bye. <laughs>